All right, it is 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific, and let's go ahead and roll. Um, thank you, as always, to our platform sponsor, Evergreen Community Development Initiative, our captioning sponsor, Mobius. And for those who came in a little bit after I posted this, I'm once again posting a captioning link there if uh, you would like to follow along with the live closed captioning. And with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer and Rogan to tell us about what is beyond the standalone bib. Infinity. Infinity is beyond. It is. Um, well, thank you for having us. Uh, for those who don't know us, I'm Rogan. I'm Jennifer. <laughs> we work with Econox. Yes, we do. Um, Jennifer has been a cataloger for a long time. I have uh, uh, been cataloging adjacent for a long time. And so we're going to talk about cataloging related stuff. Um, this is not going to be an in-depth presentation on topics. We're going to jump around a whole bunch. Um, there. And these are a number of discrete things. So. <laughs> I forgot we've got all these. There we go. So topics of discussion while well, we're going to be jumping around and we'll bounce back and forth here in a less than rehearsed way. So here's our list of things we're gonna be talking about. You can read them. Asset tree, bib sources, located URIs, meta records, search icons, parts, conjoined items, care sales. See, they don't all go together, but they are important to talk about on their own. And they're all things catalogers end up having to deal with. So yes. if you're someone who is new to cataloging in Evergreen, or you have found yourself in a situation where you can uh, do most of your job in a fairly narrow scope, and you've heard about some of these other things but haven't had to mess with them yet, then this could be potentially useful to you. Also, feel free to ask questions as we go, and uh, I will try to watch the chat. Yes. So the asset tree, this pops up in a lot of odd places. So I just wanted to go over it quickly to make sure we're all on the same page. Oops. There it you are. Appears and disappears. Um, it does. I found some oddities with uh, Google Slides at times. And, mm -hmm. but anyway. Yeah, I just like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at the top of the asset tree, you have bib records, uh, call numbers connect to bib records, and then copies connect to call numbers. The cataloging interface kind of hides this a little bit, so it's not always obvious, but it does pop up in cataloging discussion sometimes and is important, especially when we talk about development related to cataloging and things like that, uh, that copies do not directly link to bib records. So one bib record can have many call numbers and any number of copies can connect to any one of those call numbers. Call numbers can live on the system or branch or whatever level you want. And they don't all have to live at the same level in a certain org tree. It is, it, it can be pretty wild west. And to make it even more complicated, we'll often refer to call numbers as volumes, though it kind of means the same thing yeah. when we're talking about this, this structure. Yeah, early Evergreen was not super consistent in its terminology. No. The dig folks have tried to kind of work at making that more standard over the years, um, but there are still traces of the inconsistency out there. Okay, so that's our brief introduction to the kinds of things we're going to be talking about. So next, we'll talk about bib sources. These are not used all, as much as they could be, and we're going to both have experience with these in different ways. Um, it's important to say that bib sources can be, um, you can do administration via the database. So just because you don't have a bib source that you want now, you can certainly add to them. So any kind of bib source you want, you can just create work with if you don't have the access to do that then just work with whoever your admin support is to do that they can be selected in mark import and this is where i have used them most is when you're doing a mark batch import you can identify the bib source and oftentimes we just kind of overlook that 
but because you can customize these you can keep track of where your records are coming from instead of just local you can put in anything from the name of your vendor to if you're bringing them in from OCLC if you are um, getting them directly from overdrive that kind of thing because you can report on these which is really handy to know if you want to see just records that came in in the last year from OCLC or records that you're bringing in from Library of Congress or your overdrive records you can do them this way um, you can report on them you can do if you're using popularity badges you can use you can narrow them down to just a particular bib source um, and as they say there you can select them when creating a, a record to um, you want to talk a little Rogan about how it can be used as a meta descriptive element yeah you can use them as metadata in a sense for example um, if you are getting records from overdrive then you know that these are supposed to be pointing to electronic resources you could even be more granular if you have them split up and the bibs are coming as ebooks distinct from e audiobooks you can make those distinct bib sources and so you can very easily say do reports that say, hey, you know, here are these ebook records and physical holdings have been attached. Um, and I don't want to call out overdrive here, uh, but if we abstract it to, let's say, vendor records as a whole, let's just admit vendor records don't tend to be the best in the world. So sometimes a little extra metadata on top can be useful. If you're doing things like just looking, if you know that um, you've had a problem in the past with, for example, getting large print and regular print on the same record from a particular vendor and you just want to kind of report on that, this is a way to do it. If you've tagged your, essentially tagged your record by putting a data source on it, you could look just specifically at those. Sure. Yep. I mean, in a perfect world, every record would be perfect and mm -hmm. we would never need any metadata that's not inside the mark. <laughs> Wouldn't the I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. Nope. It's the, they, it's the reason we humans are still necessary. In, in the chat, I'm seeing the conversations continuing about the non-standard terminology with volumes and copies and holdings. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and Elaine says, holdings to her are call number volumes and copies. Mm -hmm. I can certainly understand that. To me, holdings are copies. Um, but this is why... It's inconsistent because right. we all have different views on it. Mm -hmm. And our, and our documentation also says different things because it reflects different iterations of Evergreen as it's evolving to. Yeah. One of these days. Okay, so let's move on to talk about record notes. And this one is all Rogan because I'll be very honest until, I don't know, was it last week, the week before? I didn't mm -hmm. realize these existed. So this is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, record notes, for those who don't know, there is a table that lives in the database. If you go into the reporter, you can see it there. Um, there are, in fact, two record notes tables, one for bibliographic uh, records and one for authority records, and they can hold notes. Um, however, there is no UI for them. Uh, there is a bug out there that I filed. I I recall seeing this for as long as I can remember, so I did not go back to see who added it when, I'm sure they had the intention of doing a full feature for it. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking about it and thinking it really would be convenient for catalogers. So uh, it could be used in data projects as it is right now uh, by staff who are doing things on the back end. But it would be nice to expose it uh, for actual catalogers. Uh, Elaine says, Jason and I, is that Jason Etheridge, Elaine? I would guess so, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, discussed having record notes when developing Evergreen. It may go back that far. I certainly remember it pretty far back um, myself. So, I I mean, these would be useful. How often do people look at 500s and go, eh, I need to put a note in the record. Mm -hmm. I don't really want it where people will see it. Um, the record notes would be really useful for that. So Absolutely. And we didn't have to use, you know, local tags in the 900s just to create things to leave messages for other catalogers. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, so I just wanted to let people know that this exists. It is usable for uh, data projects right now. And hopefully uh, we'll get a UI stuck on top of it in the not too far future, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mike Rylander is commenting in chat that it does go back to the original schema. Yep. So. 
Okay. And uh, Jane did confirm it was a secret feature, but we are unmasking it as of today. <laughs> it's no longer secret. And if anybody wants to pay for a UI to be developed for it, there's somebody <laughs> named Andrea you can talk to. Yes, just raise your hand, she'll find you. <laughs> you want to discuss the located URIs? Certainly. This is one of our my favorite topics talking about just in our last session, we spent just a second talking about electronic resources, but the A56 is key to that, of course. Um, as you'll notice, we're not talking a lot about how to do anything uh, in this presentation. This presentation is just more about um, the kinds of things that are beyond just your basic, you know, bring in your record, bring in your holdings. This is stuff, different parts of the catalog and different parts of discoverability. So when you're looking at the located URIs, it's important to use the nine subfield. It's important to use the short org name of the library. If you misspell it, it will not work as most things. Um, if you're bringing in new libraries into your consortium, you don't have to have a new 856. You can just add another subfield nine. However, if you want to have a different um, phraseology, it's late, just go with me on that word there. But for the Z subfield, you can do that. For example, in this one, you see click for access. If your patrons are used to seeing something different or something more specific than that, then you could have a second 856 if you wanted to do that or your library could determine that, no, that's not the best practice you want. You really want to have standard terminology. In that case, you want to put everything on the same 856 and just have multiple nine subfields. One of the key things here is to make sure the indicators are correct. Because once you make sure that you've got your U subfield that has the right link, you've got your Z subfield if you want to use it to say, here's how you access it. Your nine subfields, you get all that right. If your indicators are wrong, they simply won't appear in the catalog. So if you're troubleshooting URIs, make sure that your indicator one is a four to indicate that it's, you know, it's actually a URL or it's the HTTP access there. Um, it needs to go there. Your indicator two must be a zero or one um, to say it's an actual resource that needs to be um, made visible. And then the, they do have volumes. So I don't know if you've run into this before, but that could also be part of your URI. Yeah. They are uh, pretty awesome, Jordan. Yeah. I agree. I have had people, uh, do call number label reports and run into these URIs and go, what is this junk? And um, without getting into a whole other presentation about visibility, they have to do with making bids visible at certain places in the org unit structure. Um, so yes, they do have volumes and you can end up seeing them in the reporter pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, as Elaine mentioned, there's a bug report about making all second indicators visible uh, I know there are opinions on both sides about this. I kind of am of two minds on it personally. I see both sides. Um, I don't know how you feel, Jennifer. Um, my personal feeling is that there should be some way to make them not visible. And so if that's simply by, you know, if whether or not you do that in a second indicator, I don't have a strong feeling about, but there should be something that we can do to, to make them not appear. Right now, if you use the eight, um, as the second indicator of an eight, it says no display constant generated. So that's one way to do it. But on the other hand, if you've got all that you need there other than a zero or one. Yeah. If I, I think it wants, deserves community conversation. Yeah, if somebody wants to drop the launch pad ticket into chat and if you have strong feelings about it, make sure you weigh in on it. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer Pringle says we needed related resource second indicator to see that Absolutely, I agree with that one because the zero and one um, is just resource or version of resource, and two is related resource. So I can absolutely right. see making that one visible. Yeah, if that's the the bug that's there. Um, anything else about URIs? Okay, thanks, Elaine. She found that. There. Yep. Okay. I think that's kind of it. Yep. Okay. Onward. Let's go. Meta records. That's you. Meta records. Uh, meta records are one of those features that some libraries use a fair bit, uh, but I find that a lot of libraries seem to be kind of scared of and shy away from. Uh, and they're not as complicated as you may think. They're actually conceptually pretty simple, and they do something great, uh, which is they group bibs together for the same conceptual work in different forms. And why do you want to do that? Well, holds and searching. I mean, for example, uh, I'm a fan of Ben Aronovich. Uh, I like his Rivers of London books, and I'm perfectly happy reading an ebook, reading a print book. I don't care if it's hardback or paperback. 
I like the narrator, uh, Holburn Smith, who does his audio book. So I'm happy with an audio book. And when I sit down at a catalog, I'm perfectly happy getting any format replied. Uh, and for those who one wonder and think this kind of a little mysterious, well, how does it group these things together? It groups them together through a fingerprint. Now, I've provided one here from an actual item, title, author, part name, and part number. Basically, components from the 245 plus the author. And so this, using the part name and part numbers, is how it attempts to keep separated uh, parts of a larger series or work. So, for example, if you have all, what is it, 900 volumes of Bleach at this point, the manga series, it's probably not 900, but it feels like it. Um, you know, hopefully they are cataloged in the 245 with part names and part numbers to distinguish those volumes, or at least part numbers. And so in the meta record, they will be separated out that way. But of course, this means that meta records in a lot of ways are only as good as your cataloging. If you have a series like Bleach and you don't have part numbers in for them, you could end up with one giant meta record with every volume in it. So unfortunately, we don't have a way to uh, have the catalog know what's actually on the shelf yet without the record beat having the correct descriptive elements. Once we do, we'll add it though. Once we have, you know, the psychic module we can plug in. <laughs> I have a question about fingerprints. Sure. For, for the title, does it just look at the A sub field in the 245? I don't believe so. I believe it looks at the A and B. Okay, so no, that's good. Is that part uh, name? Sorry. <laughs> I should have in the chat. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, I have the part name and part number there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, by the way, is how it actually appears. It even breaks it out and says explicitly in the fingerprint, part name, part number. So. Yeah, I was just, you know, so I'm wondering, so if there's a, if somebody's got a B subfield that's a little different than, you know, just because it's cataloged, you know, creatively, if it would actually pick up as part of the meta record grouping was my impetus for that. Anyway, so maybe it's something we need to check out. Robert tells us it doesn't seem to catch the bees. They have trouble with certain children's titles. Well, that'd be something to investigate if that's yeah. a possible improvement. Um, if you can track that down and confirm it doesn't or uh, mm -hmm. put a launch pad ticket up to get more eyes on it, uh, yeah. that might be somewhere it can be improved if that's the yeah. case. Yeah, I think we'll take that as a takeaway because that was my question. Sometimes I was saying they didn't catch them, but it's because the B was a little different. But yeah, let's yeah, let's, I'll, we'll take that and, as a takeaway. And, to... and as Andrea pointed out, you can adjust the meta record fingerprinting. But if there is mm -hmm. a very broad change that would essentially benefit everybody, it might be worth adjusting in the baseline. Absolutely, absolutely. I a, know that... Notice I put a lot of ifs in that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the. Yeah, there's something about looking at the 246. Yeah, so I think that um, I think one thing would be good to do is to, you know, for anybody that wants to try them out, because I see Mary said they turned them on and then tried them and turned them off. I think knowing what the fingerprints are, at least, you know, the the baseline fingerprints would be good to to make sure that that's included in the official documentation somewhere. Yeah. But if it's I, not already, I don't know if it is or not. But the takeaway from this slide, for me anyway, isn't, you need to use meta records. No. Uh, the takeaway that I want to provide is if you haven't used them because it felt mysterious or it felt cryptic and you didn't know how they worked, this is how they work. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of what we're doing here. So we're not necessarily endorsing everything that's here. We're just talking about this as you know, a cool thing you might want to think about. Yeah. All right, let's move on. This has seemed to be my topic of the week. <laughs> actually, I actually enjoy talking about the all joking aside, search icons, search formats, and other calculations. What's a, what's kind of fun here in the next slide, I think, talks about that we've already done a presentation on that was on this week, but they're calculated from various places. It's also important to know that there's a lot of customization that can happen with these as far as the labels too. I mean, even if you're using baseline, you know, stock right out of Evergreen, if you're using the you know, just kind of what you get out of the box, you can change what they say because um these labels for search formats aren't all together human friendly. They're just using marked terms. So that was one of my biggest takeaways in the earlier 
uh, presentation, other than to also say the fixed fields are the source of many of these, which means there is some growth that can happen there. And I will pause there to let Rogan talk about possibilities with these 336, which starts talking about uh, possibly using RDA fields for search formats. Well, I, the, the, the good and bad right now is we're already pulling values from the 336, the 337, and the 338. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to set up uh, search formats and icons based on those, uh, you can already get a lot of the way there already. Um, and we can check values in the subfield A and the subfield B. The only thing that is potentially a point of complication is that we can check for an A of a certain value and a B of a certain value. We can't confirm that they are present in the same tag. Right. So if you have two 336s, now I suspect this is a long tail niche issue that wouldn't come up very often, but it is something to be aware of and consider. Absolutely. It's also just because we have, and we do have um, standard vocabulary there. We have controlled vocabulary in the 336. That it is something, as Elaine just said, that it comes up with kids yeah. because you're going to have multiple, uh, you know, content types in, in the same record sometimes. So, yeah, it's definitely something that we we would want to use only after it had been tested for these various scenarios that might pop up. Because as we talked about with um, in an earlier presentation, is you've got to make sure that you're not affecting something you didn't intend to affect when you right. infect. I did not mean infect, affect. <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's an infection. I don't maybe, know. maybe. But we'll go back to affect for today that you didn't accidentally well, effect something yeah. that you didn't want to when we're checking these out, which is you know, kind of the reason we can't just turn this on and see what happens. We'd need to, to get a, a bit of community feedback there too. And I think kits are the most likely problematic uh, yeah. thing. The, the uh, most of the scenarios I can think of where there are multiple three three sixes, for example, in the same record, um, it, it's still going to end up as the correct result. Mm -hmm. And it might be the case where you have multiple icons too, um, which you know for kids might be okay. Yeah, and Elaine says, she, "Look, the same time we think alike. <laughs> the same time right. we're okay with multiple icons." That happened. Hey, um, travel books. Yeah, see, we've got all kinds of examples about things out there that we could use these for. Um, we do like this because we know that um, RDA is going is not going away and that em embracing it in this way seems to be a nice in introduction to starting to use these fields that catalogers have been so loyally putting in now for several years that they're there. And if we can use them, then it's something we'll we'll keep investigating. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this screen, we just had links to the, yeah, I just wanted to provide yeah. a few links to uh, some other relevant presentations. Uh, Jennifer here and Kate Coleman did this same conference, so it'll be up on YouTube in a few weeks. Picture Perfect, Icons and Evergreen. Galen Charlton, I think it was last year, did Making the Most of Your Mark Record in Evergreen. It's not exactly this topic, but there's a lot of overlap, and it's an excellent uh, discussion of some of these points about you know, setting up a search format and steps through an example. And I threw up the comment, the mystery presentation here, because as we were preparing this presentation, I could have sworn that somebody did a full presentation on the exact topic of search and icon formats at some point in the last four or five years, and I could not find it. Um, I asked Jennifer about it. She thought the same thing. She could not Absolutely. find it. So if anybody <laughs> knows of this presentation that I could have sworn existed but cannot find, please let me know. Yes. Um, if not, I will do a pre-conference next year on the minutia of setting up search and uh, uh, icon formats, which I don't want to do. So please, <laughs> let me find it. Well, it is the whole fandom thing because we got that question, of course, this week too. We're like, oh, yeah, the, we, you know, how do you do it? I'm like, that's a different presentation. <laughs> about setting up new ones. Yes, and, the and, is, yeah. And it'll tell you, uh, the simplest search format you can make, you can do in about five or 10 minutes. The most complicated possible one, we need a whole pre-conference for. Yeah. So. But you can't do it on your own. That's also the takeaway. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a cooperative kind of thing, or at least, you know, catalogers through the user interface can't do it on your own. Okay. Let's move on. I don't know why that's showing those twice, but phantoms 
I think there's something with how I set up the animations. Uh, I, I did not find Google Slides as animation controls entirely intuitive. No, 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 no. So still talking about search icons. And as we were talking about, um, uh, Rogan's put together kind of a very high level, the steps that you would go through. So here's the from orbit steps for creating new search icons and formats. Yeah. Um, you're going to need a graphic to show if you're doing a, uh, an icon, of course. You don't need that for search format. Create the record attribute definitions you need. Um, fixed fields require some additional steps. Let's go yeah. through the next slide. We will. Um, I'll just say about the graphic, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we hit on, in ours is that you can't just rename a current icon that's available out there. You can't decide that, you know, you like the little the large print book, but you want to call it something else. We highly discourage that. You're going to need a new custom icon if you want a new format. Otherwise, you're just confusing matters unnecessarily. Yeah. There's my warning. Yep. And do that again. Okay. One more time. There we are. And then after you create the attributes, you're going to have to create composite uh, attribute definition entries. Um, create coded value map entries, and then re-ingest records. Again, this is obviously not instructional on how to do it. We're just kind of giving you a very broad idea of the steps. Yeah. And that's because we have a few basic takeaways that we want catalogers to have from the I when you start talking about adding new search formats and icons. And those takeaways are that you can do it. This is doable, but it's going to be a project. Don't sit down and say, you know, I'm just going to... I have got an hour free before I go home. Let's do this. Um, you're going to want to think about it. And it's going to be a collaborative project with your support staff, whether you have an internal IT department that's running your Evergreen or you're working with a hosting provider or whoever. Uh, it's going to be something that you want to talk with them about from the beginning. And one of the things that we also wanted to emphasize in ours early, I don't need to repeat what I've, I said earlier in the in the conference, but is that you want to look at your data to see if whatever icon or new format that you're defining, if it's going to pick up and redefine your data the way you want it to, or if there again, if you are going to unintentionally rename things just because your data exists in a way that maybe you didn't realize that that's what was right. there. So yeah, you don't want to throw up a new icon and suddenly, you know, 30% of your data gets a new icon that you didn't mean to be there. Yeah, if you're sitting on a substantial pool of bib records, anytime you find yourself using the phrase, well, surely I have no records that fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, yeah check yeah you're borrowing trouble at that point when you actually verbalize the surely i don't have that yeah okay and I, I i do like that there's this whole conversation about um the archaeology of conference presentations well you know because I, we're I'm for that you know we're kind of like the shoemakers whose kids have no shoes we're librarians and we don't yeah. organize our own stuff well mm -hmm. um. <laughs> yep and I am loving the, there we go, parts. I mentioned right. parts briefly. Yeah, I think we, we've already Parts are another thing. Parts. Well, why don't you take parts? <laughs> no, well, I wasn't going to say much other than <laughs> that we'd already kind of talked about it. Parts are the kind of thing that, um, much like when we looked at the basic asset tree, they don't, the parts don't live in the same place that the copy does. Does it live in the same place? They're just not really tied together in, in ways that you would imagine they are, which to me, and this is, you know, a layman's interpretation of this, is why when they're, you know, when we've gone through the angular, angu we've gone to angular for many of these screens, is parts will get left off. And I'm thinking, mm, it's because parts don't live in the same place. We have to go, remember, we also want parts brought into this at the same time. Now I recognize that might be a, an oversimplification of how the manifestation of parts live somewhere else. But to me, I go, huh, every time I'm now testing a, a launchpad bug on a new screen, I go, um, are parts there? Should parts be there? It's now my go-to because parts just live somewhere else. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I think it's instinctive to catalogers to say, oh, I'm adding a part. Something about the structure of the holdings is changing. Something is altered by my adding these parts. And it doesn't. A uh, monograph part connects a copy to a bib record and has a label assigned to it, and it's totally separate from the holdings. It's a 
totally separate thing. It's almost like adding a new kind of metadata to it. Um, Sarah mentions in chat that she says love slash hate. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a common feeling. Yep. <laughs> oh, and I think changing the name's a great idea, Elaine. More than just monographs get parts. Absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. I, I do like that that you now there's the the newer functionality that you can actually add a part in the same screen that you're adding the item. That's nice. So you yeah. don't have to go over to create a new label and then come back to use it. So that's positive. But it still doesn't mean they live. They don't live somewhere else. They still live somewhere else. But yeah. yeah. And, you know, patron education was the thing in the beginning. But I think patrons, you know, the more savvy ones picked up right away. And not every library has a good use case for parts, but some do. Mm -hmm. And it's a tool available to you. Yep, absolutely. And I'm sure there are lots of stories we can tell about implementing parts. Let's move on to conjoined items. This is one that also doesn't get used all that often in public libraries, but it's kind of cool the way this can work. To me, and, and Rogan can talk a little bit more about this, but my personal experience with it has been just in, has been almost exclusively in just working with serials to where I used to send them out to, because I was, I managed the serials for a while in one of my libraries. And so we would send these out to the bindery to have all of People Magazine, or all of, not People, goodness no, but all of National Geographic bound for the year. And so when they come back, I had all those records in Evergreen, but I needed to combine them all into one because they were now in one volume of combined records. So you can just do that as conjoined items. You can just say, take all of these episodes, uh, episodes, all of these um, different, what's the word? Okay, different months of National Geographic, the individual item records and put them together. Issues. Thank you, Elaine. You take all the issues of National Geographic and um, bind them together so that now that they are discoverable as a group, as well as the item numbers are still there. To say, you know, I got December of 2020, but now it's also part of, you know, a year from now, it's also part of the, the whole 2020 combination, which is kind of cool. Regan, other ways that you've seen conjoined items used? Um, well, if you hit forward a little bit, we should have some uh, graphics to connect oh, here and illustrate yes, there we are. a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, so that for people who aren't familiar with it, conjoined items, or I prefer to call them peers, um, and in the database, it calls them peers. and places in the interface, it calls them conjoined items. Uh, it, it's just basically associating a copy with a bib record that it doesn't share a volume or call number with. Mm -hmm. So it's a way that a copy can be associated with multiple bibs. But it's still only going to be associated with one call number. Um, I think there's a lot you could creatively do with these. You know, I, I, I think of these, I think, a lot like you do. Uh, I think of taking a bunch of magazines and doing a binding together of them. Um, you mentioned a purpose when we were chatting about this that I hadn't considered uh, of, I'm trying to remember what you called them. Oh, binge boxes. Binge boxes. I, that's what binge I cannot boxes. remember. Yes. Yeah. And I think our next, uh, our next screen has some other examples, binge boxes and on there, but yeah. yeah, binge boxes, when you're taking the, you put multiple videos together, like say you want to put together a binge box of great eighties movies, cause there are lots of them. But if you're putting three or four eighties movies together in a binge box, it's just called, you know, eighties movies, then you could do that. It becomes a conjoined item. If, if only temporarily for circulating so that they can circulate all as one, instead of trying to then scan each one of the videos and put them back into a box that you're calling a binge box before. It gets so make a, a binge box of say John Hughes, eighties movies. Exactly. Wouldn't that be great? We yeah. should I was reading a tomorrow. book the other day that talked about the thematic failures of Pretty in Pink. I'm never mm -hmm. going to be able to watch that movie the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we can help others to have the same kind of excitement. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, and that's, I mean, you could throw some books in there too. Uh, anyway. mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sure. And somebody said in there that, um, Ruth, you're, uh, along with kids and periodicals, and who said something about um, kids? Because it, it's a really great idea if you've got kits that you're putting together, and especially in the time uh, of the pandemic, I saw some really creative things that libraries were doing with kits that they were putting together because people couldn't come in and browse anymore. So they were putting together kits of multiple different kinds of formats together to send out, which is really kind of cool. But this would have been a, a great way to do that. And Josephine mentions in chat that uh, she is doing conjoined items for binge mm. boxes and that 80s comedies is one of them. 
Ah, um, two stars for you, Josephine. That's great. <laughs> I think we're doing well on time, but let's look at the next slide. Do. Let's move on. Carousels. This was talking. definitely what you wanted to talk about. So it is. It away. <laughs> the second most exciting thing I've talked about all week. Carousels. Well, I love carousels. Carousels, you know, that um, they've evolved a bit um, to make them a, a little more user friendly by user. I mean, the user interface, um, staff user interface to make these uh, visible. I think the important thing from a cataloging standpoint is I think it, at times there's a, a bit of a at least from watching them be implemented, there's a bit of a disconnect. When we talk about implementing carousels, that definition is very critical. You've got to look at your range of dates. So if you're doing something called new items, do you really want all new items or do you want new items that were cataloged in the last 30 days, 45 days, 60 days? Do you want every different kind of item? Do you want your movies and your, your, you know, your adult, material in with your children's material or do you need a separate carousel for that so i think catalogers play a critical point and at the point you're actually cataloging items to know what your carousels are doing at the same time because you might have insight that needs to be offered to whomever's maintaining those carousels because you can do things like shelving locations that would limit what's going to actually appear because if you just do newest items you're going to end up with everything that's that's new. And by new, it means when things became OPAC visible and when they became active. So if you're cataloging items, but they're not yet in an active status, if you have a workflow that puts them more in an in-process kind of status, instead of active, they're not going to show up until they actually, I mean, all of this just kind of seems to make sense. But when we start troubleshooting carousels about why you're not seeing what you wanted to see, a lot of this kind of comes into play. Um, it's kind of um, need to look at who's using those carousels too. So in, in, in what order, because now you can order the carousels, which is really kind of cool. Some of the newer development there so that it's not just a matter of when they were created, the carousels, but it's also you, you can re reorder them, which is very, very nice. So uh, Jennifer says we really love an option to show on, on order and in process. That's interesting. That might just be something we need to submit as a bug there, Jennifer. All things are possible with development. Yep. And we've talked in um, about serials too, about um, uh, ways to to be to provide a, a more clear workflow on how serials can appear or not appear in carousels as it were. So we're curious if anybody's doing that currently. Yeah, I, I have troubleshooted, troubleshot a few issues mm -hmm. um, where they, the user was setting up carousels of journals mm -hmm. and it is hard coded in carousels right now that they do not show serial level bibli. Right. So. Oh, and we've got a bug already. There we go. Fantastic. Let's all head heat while we finish our presentation today. Wonderful. Well, and we can see that carousels are getting a lot of love too. I mean, as the bugs are submitted, I think that there's a there's been some pretty. Uh, awesome response to that too from the developers looking at carousels to make them what patrons really need or would want to see whether they know they need them or not and they only get a lot of attention in terms of bugs because they're used so heavily and people like them Correct. so much mm -hmm. they really do and we didn't talk a lot about being able to set up or, or we didn't put listed on here but able being able to do those manual carousels which yeah. also takes, you know, catalogers time, but can also be quite worth it when you're putting together special collections for, for discovery or for special programs. And for those who aren't familiar with the manual carousels, basically you can run them from buckets and populate the buckets however you like. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if it's Women's History Month and, you, and your CERC staff are doing programs on that, then you can can do materials just on Women's History Month just to support that programming. So this is a time when yeah. CERC staff and catalogers can work together to, to promote that. And I'm always about crossing lines to work together. Yes, Rachel, we love them too. Okay, other kinds of Mark, Rogan? Uh, we just wanted to mention, you know, we talk about bib records all the time because they are kind of, when we talk about Mark records, they, bibliographic records is what we're dealing with 95% of the time. But there are other kinds. Uh, serials aren't used heavily in, for example, the public library market. But they certainly exist, uh, and authorities exist. And a lot of what we've talked about is applicable to these as well, in some level. 
So. Absolutely. And I think there's some really great conversations coming out of this conference too about both authorities and serials. I know that serials had a, a good interest group meeting earlier this week and authorities have come up in quite a few of ours looking specifically at things like the creating a local thesaurus for specific terms like illegal aliens and, and making it so that you can use instead of instead of or in, in addition to that using undocumented yeah. um, citizens that sort of thing. And authorities aren't something you have to go whole hog in. You know, some people feel like you have to, if you're going to do authorities, you have to hire an external processing right. service. You have to do it in bulk uh, to connect every possible record. If you just want to do some local authorities that you're crafting by hand, that's a perfectly legitimate option. Um, and I saw somebody uh, in the serials chat, I think it was yesterday, time is blurring together for me. It is. Uh, they said they were really excited about serials. And I mentioned in chat, you know, they're probably going to start using serials now. And I thought that was awesome. So mm -hmm. again, this, this presentation is about the, what tools are in the toolbox. And these are more tools. Yeah. And Elaine asked, do we mean muff heads? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Because otherwise serials would be just be in the, not the regular bib record, but in the, All right. the muff heads instead. Yeah. There and knowing that the serials module hasn't gotten a lot of um, updating recently, but if it starts to, yeah, Andrew's right, Muffet is never not funny, yeah. Um, but if serials starts to, to gain some momentum, and because it, it, you know, like like reports, it could use a little bit of updating and a little bit of help, and especially in that those JSON codes yeah. for creating, yeah. And, and the lane, we do mean Muffet. I have to admit, I tend to avoid saying that, I don't know why. <laughs> It sounds rude to me on some level, though. Um, I think catalogers can say it to one another because we know, you know. <laughs> yes, it is cataloging adjacent. You can probably say that, too. <laughs> yep. Or it could be an MFHD, which will take me. I'll never get that right, saying all of those four letters together. Yeah. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Well, and just saying MFHD sounds awful. It does. I mean, it doesn't sound a, a lot better, does it? No. Mm -mm. Um, no. Okay. Okay. I think that that's probably. And if that covers it. our time, uh, we wanted to leave time for questions and discussion. You know, no. Anytime we're talking about a toolbox, um, everybody has their favorites. So, and we can add other people to the screen for chatting if they want as well. Sure. Oh yeah. If you, if uh, any people want to um, talk verbalize their questions, just click the uh, share your audio video and I can let you in. Yeah. This is a community. We should commune. Jane has a question about conjoined items. She says, I'm trying to wrap my mind around conjoined items. So bib record would have many items attached, but only one of those items would have a barcode and be able to circ. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Our simple answer. Yes. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Yep, or they all circle one barcode. Yep, that's how they work. Kind of cool. And I like that things like bench boxes, you can do that temporarily. I, I do like that very much. Because in the past, I was doing something that was not going to be undone. Because when you bind magazines, you don't unbind them. Yeah. It does. Yeah, it is. It does have multiple bib records yeah. attached, but just circles with one barcode. Right. So, Irene, you're, you're also right. It's also, both yes. of those. Yes, all of that. Yep. <laughs> yes, Critter Talk. Okay. Well, we do have a few more minutes here, or, you know, we could just buy back a few minutes if anybody needs just a break from conference. We're the last session of the day, though, right? You uh, think I would see. have my schedule around here? No, but... there is one more set of events So, we need us. to get out of the way. Uh, and oh, that's on... right. In yep. fact, uh, I don't know if it's going to be particularly relevant to uh, anything we've talked about. But Galen know. Charlton is doing an implication of earworms for evergreen metadata. And yep. That sounds cataloger friendly. So, well, uh, and the one right after us is also about care sales. Yep. So, yeah, in this, in this track, uh, we're in this room where we are now, that'll be the care sales will be coming up at 430. And then in track one, it'll be earworms in evergreen metadata. So. Maybe Galen will sing us a song. And and it will stick with us. I, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of sad that I won't see that. But yeah. yeah. 
The, the, yeah. the, but both of the programs following up are both uh, very catalogery and metadata oriented. So. Yay. Yep. April asked the question, has there ever been a conjoined items presentation? I don't recall one either. Andrea Rogan, do you recall seeing? I don't recall anybody ever doing it. I, 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 in the course of uh, looking for that other mystery presentation, I looked through about the last five years uh, as posted on the Evergreen website, and I don't recall seeing one for those, which just kind of surprises me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, um, that does not ring a bell, but I, so many years of presentations swim through my brain that that's not reliable that I, that I don't remember. Did somebody do it? Yeah, absolutely. I feel if like it, we're a yeah. little short on catalog of presentations some years anyway. Some years. I think we were good this year, but yeah, some yeah. years we really we did are. a good job this year, but that is an almost perennial request from the end of conference survey is more cataloger mm -hmm. content. So yep. yeah. Well, and I think that this conjoined items thing is is taking on a new kind of life uh, in this whole putting materials together and circulating them together. Because it used to be it was kind of, you know, if you weren't doing serials, then what were you, you know, what yeah. were you conjoining? <laughs> but Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was much more academic, but I think public libraries are getting creative too. Um, I see Janet's asked a question a couple of times. So about the monograph parts, when you have hundreds oh. of them attached to a bib, it times out. Mm. I don't think that interface has been updated to Angular yet, has it? Mm. I mean, if, there, yeah, I don't, I don't know what so. block is happening there. There's a couple of possibilities. Um, there, if, there are, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, if there's not a bug report for that, there, we, we can can do that. Yeah. And we'll research. So I'll put that on my takeaway, too. We've got a couple of things. Same angle from from seven. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Mo most of the things that, like, on the open surf level would, you know, uh, uh, choke at a couple hundred have been yeah. resolved, but... I mean, I'm just spitballing blindly here. I don't know where the block is. Yeah. All right. So we'll put that on one of our takeaways too here. It'd be a good thing to try to replicate and find out why it's happening. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing it up, Janet. Others are, I'm sure, experiencing the same thing. Okay. It was angularized with the rest of the staff catalog. Okay. That helps hmm. to know. Um, in okay, well, seven. it is three till, so we should probably make room for the next folks. Thank yep. you for having us. Bye. Thank you both very much. This was great. Um, we'll uh, take a little bit of a break, and then we'll be back at 4.30 uh, 